You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Tonight, we're going to be reading this paper on African unification movements. Uh, it's a pretty old paper, uh, but I always say that you learn from the past to guide your steps in the present, to let you know what to do and not to do in the future. Uh, I noticed, uh, you know, there's some activity in the chat room already. Uh, so big ups to Kevin Care 42 who's become a regular of the show. Uh, Black Excellence as well has become a regular. In the chat room, they're saying, brothers and sisters, please carry a recording device when you go out. This propaganda that the Asian and Muzungu are pushing is getting dangerous. Many Asians now are getting bold and will try to pick a fight with us. We must record this evidence, but if they put their hands on you legally, you can't protect yourself. NYC Beauties says, Black First, yes, it is going to get dangerous, and I always carry a recording device on me. This propaganda will backfire badly on the Asian community. Goes on to say there is already a boycott going on right now. Even before the pandemic, they were losing money. Now it is getting worse for them. Kevin Care 42 says to NYC Beauties, we have everything we need in our community. We should turn those billions we spend on them to our own community. They do not sell anything essential anyway. Uh, Black Excellence agrees, says that they start buying their fake goods and foods after the Peter Liang ruling. Black first, hashtag black first. Uh, NYC Beauty, uh, sorry, Kevin K42 says to NYC Beauties and Black Excellence, enough is enough. Do not use violence, withhold your money, as Brother Harvey from your world always says, quote, know your history and control your dollars. And the quote, hashtag black first. Uh, oh, Black Excellence just reminded me I need to look into this hashtag Nubian. Black fur, uh, so he says, hashtag black first, hashtag Nubian C, hashtag abandoned Asian business, hashtag support black business, hashtag, hashtag B1. Kevin Care says, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Help this channel grow. Absolutely. Help the channel grow by liking it, liking our episodes, uh, commenting in the chat during the live session, or even in the. You know, after uh, doing the playback, make sure you drop some comments, you know. And uh, subscribe and click the bell to be notified when I have new content. Uh, before I go any further, I want to remind you guys that this show <clears throat> is a part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. There are other shows on the network that you should be checking out. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace family, this is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Also, make sure to check out the Queen's Council podcast. Check out the Queen's Council podcast. Uh, if you guys were around during the weekend, you know, I talked about it last week on different shows, different episodes of this show. 
Uh, the Pro Black Perspective did a debate. Uh, you guys should check that debate out with uh, Only Time Save versus Anna Bookman. Uh, check out that debate when you have a chance. I was in the chat room. I saw a couple of, couple of names I recognized, but there was a lot of unfamiliar faces. Or I should say unfamiliar names. Uh, so it was pretty good to see the turnout for that. Um, so let's check out everything on KWAZ Radio, all right? Uh, to uh, to continue with this paper now, right? <clears throat> African Unification Movements, Erasmus H. Cloman Jr. The numerous unification efforts now underway in Africa represent one of the most significant developments in the brief post-independence era of that continent. Before I go any further, I want to address... Uh, what the, what the folks in the chat room were talking about it just dawned on me i never commented on it personally uh there is a asian guy who's connected to hip-hop i just drew a complete blank on his name ben baller ben baller is this asian guy uh who's been in hip-hop for a number of years i think he's in his 50s now so he's been around quite a bit. And Ben Baller actually called out to stop the Asian hate hypocrisy. I don't know if Kevin Care, NYC Beauties, etc., cetera, uh, saw that. But Ben Baller was like, yo, I, you new brand Asians don't understand. Our, our ancestors, our elders were shitty folks to black people, right? Entitled and racist and the like. And so if you want to, if you want to charity, it begins at home, right? So, I mean, I don't put much stock in these folks anyway, but at the very least, it shows you that some of these folks understand. They know <clears throat> that their folks are, you know, on a bunch of shit. And so like Kevin Kiss, uh, Black Excellence, etc., said in the chat, NYC Beauties, uh, just withhold your dollars, man. Withhold your dollars. But the thing I always say too, withholding dollars is fine. What we got to start learning to do is fill the gaps. If we withhold the dollars, right, we economically starve them out, you got to understand there's a reason why they're in the community to begin with. They're there to make money, yes. But they're also there because they fill a gap. Black folks, you know, uh, in these areas that have food deserts, for the most part, you know, they have access to this Asian food that's relatively inexpensive. Uh, I don't know how real it is, this, that, and the other, but I know that it's relatively inexpensive. And, you know, it's affordable for folks who are in a certain economic place. What black folks need to start to do, because Asians do this too, black folks need to, need to learn to, to get in there, right, and go and make their food. If folks like Chinese food so much, go and make Chinese food or whatever. Right? These Chinese be making Mexican food and all that shit all the time and soul food and all that shit so go and do the same thing you gotta fill those gaps because if you don't fill those gaps black folks are going i'm telling you black folks are going to push back and go right back and seek out chinese folks to come back in the neighborhood and allow chinese folks to make that money i'm saying chinese but i mean asian right you we've got to learn the, the entrepreneurs have got to learn you got to go ahead and give them the alternative and boycotting is going on, you gotta say, hey, don't go to that Asian store. Look right across the street, there's a black store. Head over there, right? You gotta have those alternatives, like, present, right? So that's my one take on that. Uh, economically starve them out, of course. Have the alternative set up. Because if you don't fill the gap, someone else will come in and fill the gap. Instead of it being Chinese, it'll be some goddamn... Uh, some goddamn Russians or something. So you got to fill those gaps too. That's the thing you always want to keep in mind. We have work to do, right? If you're going to boycott, 
you still gotta make uh something happen if you want to boycott netflix right you gotta you gotta promote something like quelly tv or something like that right i'm just saying like you have to have the alternative where people get the access uh kevin care just said dogecoin went up in value since last night yeah i got me uh i got me a good a good number of dogecoin reese i think it went up to six cents last night or maybe a little over six cents last night is that is that correct kevin care i think it went up to a little bit i don't have my phone with me i think it went up a little bit above six cents actually i have my phone um let's see i mean you know i should be reading the paper right now but all of this information it's pretty important um i gotta tell you my investment has started to look real good right now and i'm really just doing like incremental uh buying right so it tells you that if you really have that dough to play with you put it out there and you and you, you you play it smartly uh you can make some you can make some dough here by investing uh doge yeah dogecoin is now uh a little higher than six cents now and i know for a lot of people they'll be like what but think about this this is what i think about if you buy let's say you buy a thousand pieces of dogecoin right let's say you bought it when it was five cents right um you buy a thousand pieces of dogecoin uh that's only going to cost you about 50 bucks let's say dogecoin goes the way of bitcoin where you know it it goes to a dollar right for for for, for your 50 dollar investment right those those a thousand pieces now are worth a thousand dollars right let's say dogecoin doesn't even go as far as you know what bitcoin and and uh, ethereum did right let's say let's say dogecoin goes up to 10 bucks you see what i'm saying ten thousand dollars for 50 for 50 dollar for, for 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 buying in at fifty dollars, you know it goes up. And the thing that you don't want uh, to do is uh, you don't want to let this stuff keep passing you by. I, I, and by the way, I think Dogecoin, as a matter of fact, I think one of the things with Dogecoin that's going on is that this this number one celebrities are talking about it. And number two, I think a lot of folks who missed out on the Bitcoin goings on are saying to themselves, I'm not letting this one pass me, right? Remember, Bitcoin at one point was, was like a penny, it was like, it was like pennies, right? And then like 2009, it went like to a dollar. The next year, it was like 13 bucks at some point, you know? So, and now look where it is, you know? So uh, be smart join the discord we put the link in the chat room join the discord you have guys like kevin care 42 and others who are discussing and posting information on uh, cryptocurrency you know blockchain all that kind of stuff so uh you know get on the board now you know get on board now anyway got a paper to read here so let's talk about it okay african unification movements the numerous unification efforts now underway in africa represent one of the most significant developments in the brief post-independence era of that continent freedom has brought with it increased recognition in many african quarters of the of the interdependence of the african states and the need for unified approaches to common problems the new countries together with the handful of older independent African states 
have nearly all become involved in one or more of the intensified drives towards some form of integration. Paradoxically, the issue of how to achieve unity is becoming one of the principal divisions between African states, right? Uh, if you are on social media, and you, you, you are within, and you are within my circle of folks on social media, you'll see this has been a topic, uh, you know, lately. In view of the centuries, it has taken the Western European nations to progress just to the point where the European movement stands today. It is scarcely remarkable that as yet unification efforts in Africa have not evolved into a single rational and steady movement. On the contrary, the directness of the head-on approach which sovereign African states have taken to promote closer cooperation or unity with each other is one of the outstanding and possibly more promising features of the contemporary African political scene. Nationalism in the independent states of Africa is a very recent development and is far less deeply rooted than the history-laden nationalism which has plagued the European movement. Even so, many of the nationalist-inspired rivalries between African states are not easily bridged. Nationalism in the new African states had its origin in the colonial era. The 15th century partitioning of Africa by the European powers resulted inevitably in the isolation of the colonies from one another. Having been oriented for so long toward metropolitan capitals with anti-pathetic colonial policies and differing cultural systems, the African states have had some difficulty in replacing those past colonial associations with new intra-African relationships. The colonial administrations in Africa deserve full credit for the benefit they brought and indeed for the provision of the only available means of transition from tribal society to modern state. So this tells you the mindset, right? At the same time, it must be acknowledged that the European powers were late in recognizing the intrinsic value of unity in Africa and have only recently begun to encourage any of the more far-reaching unification efforts which seek to bridge the gaps between former colonial empires. Advocates of Pan-Africans, one of the oldest of the continent's unification movements, have often proposed as a goal a quote-unquote United States of Africa. They have sought to apply to Africa some version of the principle of federal union which has achieved such success in the United States. But Africa today faces far different and in some ways more complex problems than those which confronted the 13 colonies. Africa is less homogeneous, less compact, and far less prepared politically, economically, and socially for federal union. Hmm. Nor is Africa, as was the United States, in its infancy, able to escape pressures created by outside forces seeking to play power, polit power politics. You know, that's a good point, too. That's a real good point, actually. The, the thing about Africa, Africa has been around from the beginning. It's been around a long time. And so to change, to create change in the goings-on, right, it's going to be a hell of an undertaking, right? America was a homogeneous society, mostly, right? And, <clears throat> you know, and tighter, in a sense. Like, folks will only, go into school, will only come into certain parts of the U.S. in the beginning before they started to forge West, etc., and so it was just a little bit easier uh, for those folks to, to figure out how to get along, how to play together, right? And then lastly, because of what Africa represents on this planet, uh, you have a bunch of power play politics going on. You have a bunch of folks who are, uh, who are trying to uh, 
you have a bunch of folks who are trying to sabotage the goings on in the continent right and that's you know all of those things contribute to the issues of we see of unification in africa we have to be honest about these things right most african leaders are not really interested in the cold war struggle between east and west and would prefer to remain apart from it as so to concentrate on finding solutions to africa's pressing internal problems dude blasting music outside the nature of the cold war or more particularly the communist strategy for waging it is such that no important area of the world can avoid being touched by the struggle Mm. isn't that true an area such as africa which combines strategic and economic importance with a vast potential for unrest and instability can only be a prime target for communist bloc penetration and subversion the ideological conflict on which the cold war struggle is based is already reflected to a significant degree in the conflict between different differing african approaches to unification few african leaders are willing to renounce all aspects of marxist socialism as an unmitigated evil okay Many are willing to borrow from the experience of communist countries, which have dealt with problems similar to those confronting Africa. Some are willing to go much further than others in this borrowing process. All African leaders proclaim their neutralism, or as they prefer to call it, non-alignment in the Cold War. But in the international relationships of the African states, a wide variety of interpretations is discernible in their foreign policies and international connections. While the cultural ties and sympathies of some countries remain primarily with the former colonial powers and the nations of the West, a few African regimes have moved far in the direction of closer ties with the communist world. The leaders of these regimes believe that the most effective means of increasing their political leverage and obtaining outside economic aid is a hard-hitting neutralist game in which East and West are played off against each other. While important differences undoubtedly distinguish the political leanings amongst various African leaders and factions, including those which separate Nkrumah from the more moderate elements, these differences should not be allowed to obscure the goals which African nationalists share in common. They all declare themselves dedicated to improving the standards of living of the African peoples, to increasing Africa's influence in world affairs, to maintaining African neutralism in the Cold War struggle, to winning the independence of the remaining African dependencies, and to promoting unity among all the African nations. These goals may seem to be of such a general nature, so far from fulfillment as to have little bearing on contemporary African affairs. But the similarities and objectives provide an important common bond between all African nationalist movements. Advocates of Pan-Africanism know that their appeals have a ready audience among the millions of Africans throughout the continent who are making the sometimes exhilarating but usually painful transition from primitive to to, 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 to civilized society. Thus, Nkrumah, though he may be mistrusted by many leaders and elites outside Ghana, has struck a responsive chord among the masses in many other parts of the continent. One stimulus toward unity is represented by the common continent-wide interests from which Pan-Africanism draws its, its strength. The second stimulus, the attraction of regionalism, also exerts a strong influence, playing an increasingly important role in shaping the makeup of African groupings. In a mood similar to that which is drawing the nations of Europe closer together, neighboring nations in Africa seek ways to combine their physical and human resources and to minimize the sometimes harmful effects of boundaries arbitrarily imposed in the colonial partitioning of Africa. The Casablanca block. Uh, the Casablanca powers, as we shall note, 
more fully below are concentrated in North Africa with a smaller but powerful appendage in West Africa. Separate, a, a second grouping, the Monrovia powers, cover the rest of West Africa and Middle Africa. Now, a third grouping is evolving in East, Central, and Southern Africa. An intriguing but highly debatable question is whether regionalism or ideology is exercising a greater pull in determining the makeup and character of African groupings. The pace of change far exceeds the expectation of those who knew Africa in the earlier era of colonialism. The consolidation movements now underway are both an instrument and a symptom of change. In order to assess the strengths and weaknesses of these various movements, the following analysis seeks to examine briefly their origins, their orientations, and their interrelationships. This brings us to a section called the Ghana Guinea Mali Union. All right now, we talked about this only to say and I on our crossover uh, show uh, a few weeks back, and neither of us were familiar with this Ghana Guinea Mali Union, which to me says a lot about said union. Right? So, we're going to read a little bit about it. I see in the chat room. Uh, Kevin Care 42 says hyperinflation is coming for the US dollar. Black excellence agrees. Kevin Care, uh, NYC Beauty says, let's all become wealthy together. I agree. Join the Discord, right? Join the Discord. Come and read up all the articles, all the uh, Google Drives of information, the textbooks and come and ask questions and have discussions about how to build our wealth. Remember at the beginning of the year, I talked about, let's make this year a year about health, wealth, and relationships, right? Uh, NYC Sports Archives is here for the first time, it seems, saying, hello, Kevin K led me to this channel. Just what I was looking for, very balanced commentary. Thank you. Bit of medicine podcasts. Uh, Black Excellence says many of these African countries are like a garden after a long winter. They're going to be weed misleaders. The weeds take all the nutrients from the useful plants and enrich itself. Black Excellence goes on to say once you remove the weeds or the misleaders, the malnourished plants start to grow, flourish, and bear fruits. Kevin Care agrees and, and says it was a great analogy. Uh, the pro-black perspective is here, piece of the pro-black perspective. Like I said, check out the last two or three episodes for sure. From the pro-black perspective, he had a busy weekend, that's only to say, uh, with a debate, a group discussion, you know, a warship. So you guys check out the work uh, that that brother has done. He says it's due time that we get familiar with the Ghana, Guinea, Mali union. All right, let's do that. When, in 1958, Guinea elected to stay out of the French community, he had made a breach in that institution which was never, which has never been sealed. France's injured pride, abetted by the prodding of President uh, Houphouët uh, Boigny of the Ivory Coast, prompted the ill-conceived French retaliatory withdrawal from, from Guinea. Ghana's Nkrumah was quick in offering to form an association with a fellow revolutionary, President Seiko Toure of Guinea. Very short order, the two leaders announced a constitutional union of their two countries, compassing common economic policies, a 10, pound, a 10 million pound loan by Ghana to Guinea and even some combination of parliamentary institutions. When Mali, formerly Sudan, uh, subsequently broke off from an abortive federation with Senegal in 1960, they joined Ghana and Guinea in what is officially called the Union of African States. News to me. The three countries, uh, is that news to me? The three countries met in uh, Bamako, in Bamako in July 1961 
and issued a charter of union which called for a mutual defense agreement and cooperation in diplomatic, economic, cultural, and research activities. That's what I like to hear. Right? That's what I like to hear. Right? Mutual defense agreement, cooperation in diplomatic, economic, cultural, and research activities. This is what our folks need to be working on today. Right? No common institutions were authorized in the Charter, but the conferences of the three heads of state were regarded as the Union Supreme Body. Thus far, this much vaunted Union has appeared to be of uncertain substance. Guinea has even exhibited a reluctance to take full advantage of its loan from Ghana. Ah. Talk of a common currency has proved to be no more than talk, and there have been no joint parliamentary sessions. Ghana, which first took the initiative in promoting this arrangement, appears to be the only member of the Union with unreserved enthusiasm for its perpetuation. Mm. Upper Volta finds itself a territorial interposition between the three members of this Union. A question of considerable uh, moment in the political evolution of West Africa hinges therefore on Upper Volta's future course. Krumah has busied himself for some time with the overtures toward this northern neighbor, and already the two countries have entered into agreements on broadening exchanges and eliminating border controls. Although Upper Volta has not been able to conclude as favorable economic relationships with the Ivory Coast as had been hoped, its ties with the French-speaking countries are sufficiently strong to make Nkrumah's prospects for attaching Upper Volta to the Ghana, sorry, to the Ghana, Guinea, Mali Union appear slight. Should Nkrumah succeed, however, the entire power picture in West Africa would alter radically. Ghana, instead of being encircled by the French-speaking states of Ivory Coast, Upper Volta, and Togo, would dominate a new coalition which would encircle the Ivory Coast, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. As long as Upper Volta remains in the grouping of ex-French states centered on the Ivory Coast, the Ghana, Guinea, Mali Union is deprived of any prospect of complete fulfillment. Upper Volta, I gotta do my research now. Nkrumah's wooing of President Yamiogo, Upper Volta is poaching on the territory of the French-speaking African community. That community, however, is simultaneously encroaching on Nkrumah's territory by seeking to lure back into its fold both Guinea and Mali. See, that's what we talk about. That's, that's what we talk about, the constant power plays, man. Right? Uh, the pro-black perspective likes black excellences analogy too. Right? Uh, which the pro-black perspective, uh, sorry, which the black, which black excellence thanks the pro-black perspective. Okay? But that's it. That's an interesting thing there. Right? Why didn't this federation occur? And we gotta look at Upper Volta a little bit closer. The Casablanca powers, right, is the next section of the paper. The Casablanca powers first met as a group in the capital of Morocco in early January 1961. Governments represented included the North African Arab states of Egypt, Morocco, and Libya, together with the Algerian Exiled Nation Liberation Front, and the Ghana, Guinea, Mali trio. Libya has since removed herself from this group to join the Monrovia powers. The ostensible reason for calling the Casablanca Conference was to coordinate African policies on the Congo. In reality, however, the most compelling consideration which led King Mohammed V of Morocco to convene the meeting was a sense of isolation following Morocco's defeat on the issue of its claim to hegemony over Mauritania in the General Assembly of the UN in December 1960. 
The other ex-French states are not invited to Casablanca because of their position favoring moratorium independence. Several other pro-Western states were invited but declined to attend. The, the Moroccan monarchy found itself in the somewhat anomalous position of embracing the most radical elements of African politics in a liaison which several weeks earlier would have seemed highly plausible. The conference was hurriedly called as a counterpoise to the productive meeting of the 12 ex-French states as, at Brazzaville in December 1960. The Casablanca powers hoped to grab the ball of African unity before a rival faction could pick it up and run with it unopposed. The meeting, oh sorry, the meeting in Casablanca did not succeed in disguising the fact that those gathered there were beset by numerous internal differences. The competition between the expansionist ambitions of Nasser and Nkrumah was, and remains, an extremely divisive issue. Other questions dividing various nations of the Casablanca group include Mauritanian independence and conflicting claims to Saharan oil, as well as different approaches toward Arab and North African unity. Almost the only common bond shared by the strange, bedfo strange bedfellows whom misery brought together in the Casablanca grouping is that of anti-colonialism, particularly evident in antipathy towards French North African policy. The Casablanca powers have earned the reputation of being the troublemakers on the contemporary African political scene. But fortunately for the West, they make trouble for each other in their uneasy union, as well as other states in Africa. The Casablanca grouping, in effect, represents the limits of progress which either Nkrumah or Nasser has made in, fulfill in fulfilling his competing pan-African dreams of unity by a formal association of nations. Uh, this brings us to a section called the All African People's Conference. When I was listening to one of those joint discussions the pro-black perspective one of the sisters if i'm not mistaken she was a part of uh the all african people's conference if i'm not mistaken three all african people's conferences have been held at accra in 1958 oh i'm sorry the all african people's party is, is, is what i think she was involved in three all african people's conferences have been held at accra in 1958 at Tunis, in 1960 and at Cairo in 1961. Nowhere has the divisive effect of the personal rivalry between Nkrumah and Nasser been more in evidence than in this series of conferences. In fact, the rivalry between these two leaders has threatened to uh, vitiate the work of a network of political activists engaged in promoting the concept of African solidarity notably in the Cairo and Accra conference uh, secretariats, but also in centers scattered throughout the northern half of the African continent. I mean, more and more you read about the northern half of the African continent, you kind of know how you need to proceed when it comes to African unity, right? These conferences are the same, uh, uh, as the name implies, are composed of representatives of private and unofficial organizations. Government representatives attend only as observers. A substantial portion of observers at each conference have been representatives of various communist bloc countries. The conferences and their permanent machinery serve as one of the principal channels for the introduction of communist funds into Africa. When the All African conference were, uh, Conferences were initiated, the Soviets held out high hopes that they would provide a forum of uninhibited communist propaganda and agitation. But Nasser, who has consistently refused to legalize the Communist Party in the United Arab Republic, has disappointed Soviet hopes for an Egyptian 
fiefdom, demonstrating that he is not in anyone's pocket. Basic principle of Soviet strategy, however, is to probe every avenue of opportunity. Nassau was not a willing tool. Other African nationalists might prove more susceptible to Soviet blandishments. Communists are now working busily to infiltrate the African solidarity movements in an increasing number of African countries, and particularly in Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Somalia, and the Congo. Okay. The third conference, from the viewpoint of its participants, was regarded as a letdown from previous meetings. Although numerous Soviet and Eastern Bloc observers were on hand, Soviet-Egyptian rift must have seemed a heavy pall on conference proceedings. The conference drew few African officials as observed than, than either of the preceding meetings in the series, an indication that interest was waning. Some 200 delegates representing a wide range of non-official organizations and independent and dependent territories took part in the meetings. But after passing five major resolutions similar to those adapted at many other gatherings of anti-colonial nationalists, the conference disbanded without making any significant lasting impression on the African political scene. So this brings us to a section on the conferences of independent African states. The first conference of independent African states was held in Accra in April 1958 while the second conference took place in Addis Ababa in June 1960. Five of the members of the Casablanca grouping, the United Arab Republic, Libya, uh, Morocco, Ghana, and Guinea, an observer, attended the Accra conference. Other countries represented at each of these two meetings included Ethiopia, Liberia, Sudan, and Tunisia. Attendance at the second conference was augmented by observers from Angola, Kenya, South Africa, Southwest Africa, Tanganyika, Uganda, uh, Northern and Southern Rhodesia, Rwanda, Uruni, Sierra Leone, and Cameroon. The only French territory represented. Conferences in this series are scheduled for every two years, and the 1962 meeting was held or, or, or would be held early in April in Tunis. The intellectual origin of this series of meetings was the 1945 Pan-African Nationalist Conference held in Manchester, uh, in Manchester, England, whose moving spirits included Nkrumah, Kenyatta, and the West Indian Negro, George Padmore. The latter subsequently became advisor on African affairs to Prime Minister Nkrumah. Before his death in 1959, Padmore exercised a very strong influence on Nkrumah and perhaps more than any other single individual, helped to transform Pan-Africanism from an idea into a political movement. Uh, to you guys' knowledge, you guys listen to me live or in the playback, you leave this in the comment section. Is any governments in the continent doing this now? Are there any governments in the continent that are working with Africans in the Caribbean or, or, or Africans in America, right, who are like advisors, almost chief advisors to, to the work being done on the continent. Is there any leader that you know of today that's doing this, right? Uh, is there any leader who's doing this today? Other forebearers of this African conference series were the Bangdong Conference in 1955 and the Cairo Conference in 1957 of the Afro-Asian Neutralist Countries. Afro-Asian Neutralist Countries, okay. The Accra Conference in 1958 reaffirmed the Bandung Declaration of 1955 and passed other resolutions expressing grave alarm. Quote, unquote, grave alarm a great power politics and calling for a greater role for the neutralists in world affairs. 
you know, to assert their collective influence, at least in Africa. The independent African states have also held two special conferences on specific African problems. In August 1959, a, con a conference on the Algerian problem was held in Monrovia. One year later, a second conference took place in, in, in Leopoldville on the Congo crisis. Out of this latter meeting emerged a proposal advanced by a Ghanaian delegation to establish an African high command. This military force was to be composed of troops assigned by independent African states and was to be charged with responsibility for safeguarding peace on the African con uh, continent, which is a great idea, right? The proposal has not moved beyond the stage of discussion in committee, although it has gained support from the Casablanca powers. Kuma has subsequently sought to promote the concept on numerous occasions without notable success in convincing non-Casablanca group leaders. This brings us to a section called All African Trade Union Federation. Let me check in with the chat room. You know, the chat room here is always lit. Uh, Dorico Kuma Photography is in the room. Peace to that brother. It says, peace family, hyperinflation is coming. Get your money out of the banks. Bail-ins are coming. Keyword, force, majeure. Meaning they will take your money. You can't legally do anything about it. That's wild. That's, that's something we should talk about on the show. That's something folks who are familiar with uh, what's going on here. Uh, maybe we should do in fact you know what i was thinking about doing i was actually thinking we should have more discord discussions not not to be live stream but just hop, hop on the voice channel i have more discord discussions you guys who are listening if you're just stumbling across this podcast we have a discord server all right there's the link hop on the discord because I intend to have more Discord only conversations. Meaning, if you're not on the Discord, you're gonna lose out. Guys like Kevin Care, 42, Dorico Cooper, and, and others are dropping dimes of knowledge on the Discord, giving you links to uh, to to book the book uh uh, book depositories, you know, g giving you links to videos, stuff to, to 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 give you more information. And I think I'm going to start rewarding some of that stuff in the sense of having Discord-only conversations, where unless you're on the Discord, you won't know what we talk about. You won't know the money moves people are making. So that's something I'm going to probably do. Kevin Care 42 says, these Northern African countries, Arabs, Think of us in their language as abid, or slaves. They are not for us. We must advance as black and black only journey. Goes on to say I, it would be a waste of time to deal with them. Uh, I agree with that. In fact, I'm a kind of a person, I, I think about, I, I think down the road, about how do we get them up out of there, right? How do we get them up out of the continent too? Right, uh, NYC Sports Archive says to me, Arabs have never had respect for us. They traded our ancestors as slaves and forced their religion upon us. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Black Excellence says to NYC Sports Archives, true. I once spoke to a lady in Brooklyn. She told me her son was playing with the Arab or Yemeni store owner son. Son was uh, playing a game called Slave Catcher. Oh, her son being the slave, of course. Uh, uh, the pro-black perspective says, I don't know of any pan-African advisors, so I guess the Akon, the Akon nonsense, but also like Dorico says, Arikana. Oh yeah, the Dorico Kubu uh, photography mentioned H-E Arikana. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. The ambassador. That's right. Yeah. So you're right. Uh, 
You're right. Um, but 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 isn't she from Zimbabwe? Right? Isn't she from Zimbabwe? And, and that acorn stuff is nonsense, as the pro-black perspective pointed out. Right? But I, I think that's something that could easily be be done by by African leaders. Right? Reach out to folks, you know, talented folks in the Caribbean, reach out to talented folks in America, et cetera, and have them become, you know, your advisors, right? Uh, yeah, she's Zimbabwean, right? Does she, has she reached out to others in the diaspora? Uh, to continue. All African Trade Union Federation, or the AATUF. Still another facet of the Casablanca orientation in contemporary African affairs is the movement for establishment of the All African Trade Union Federation. The motives of African union leaders in seeking to form an All African Labor Federation, independent of international labor organizations, parallel the political drive toward Pan-Africanism. It may not seem surprising, uh, therefore, that Ghana has been so prominent among the states seeking to dominate the movement toward unification of African labor organizations. After prolonged pulling and hauling among African labor leaders, a meeting intended to launch the controversial AATUF was finally held in late May 1961 in Casablanca with representatives of 45 African trade union organizations from some, from some 30 African countries assembled. The rigged nature of the gathering became apparent as soon as the invitations for it were dispatched. Several representative African labor organizations were pointedly not, not invited. Those unions which accepted invitations were accredited by a preparatory committee weighted in favor of the encrumist Casablanca wing. Heavy-handed discrimination in designing the voting power, and sorry, in, in designating the voting power of various delegations, however, could not disguise the deep difference of opinion on the key issue before the conference. For example, the Casablanca bloc's insistence on disaffiliation of African labor unions from existing international labor organizations in order to make way for the new AATUF. Uh, do you guys know or understand why the Casablanca bloc would disaffiliate itself? Right? In, in, in that endeavor, please post that in the chat room. Strong opposition to disaffiliation came from the delegations representing unions of Kenya, Tunisia, and Nigeria, and most of the other 20-odd unions affiliated with the International Conference of Free Trade Unions, the pro-Western International, in which AFL-CO plays an important role. The Ghana and Guinea delegations resort to blatantly coercive tactics in steam ro in steam rollering through a vote for disaffiliation of all african unions within 10 months after the signing of the proposed aatuf charter the communist dominated world federation of trade unions had long since prepared itself to back the ghana guinea line at casablanca by severing direct affiliations with all but one african labor union uh, the WFTU, which is the World Federation of Trade Unions, organization in Cameroon. The vote on disaffiliation was taken on the last day of the conference after a large percentage of the delegates had decided to boycott the meetings in order to demonstrate their opposition to the preparatory committee's tactics. The Casablanca powers had manipulated a short-lived victory at, Casabl at Casablanca. John Tedega head of Ghana's Trade Union Congress, was named Secretary General of the AATUF. But Tedega's domination of the movement and the entire Casablanca orientation of the AATUF 
made it highly suspect in the eyes of those who had suffered defeat at the May conference. I, I, I gotta, I gotta really immerse myself in this now because I need to understand, you know, why this and why that, right? Uh, I really gotta understand this. If you guys understand what that really meant, uh, you guys post that into, in, in the chat room. Uh, help me understand it as well. So this brings us to a section called the African Trade Union Confederation, or the ATUC. Before I do that, though, let me take a quick station ID break. I'll be back on the other side. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. All right. Make sure to also check out the Queen's Council podcast here on KWAZ Radio. So to continue, uh, let, me, let me peep in with the chat room for a second. In the chat room, Kevin Care42 reminds everyone to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Help this channel grow. I agree. Rico Cooper Photography says Angola. Uh, Djibouti, Congo, Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, Rwanda, Uganda are the only African countries I've been to so far. I like I like how Dorico just dropped that casually, right? The guy lists about eight different places and says, you know, that's the only African countries I've been to so far when a lot of us haven't, you know, arrived yet to one country. But I'm going to change that. Like I said, this is a year in particular where the focus is on health, wealth, and relationships. And that also means to extend those ideas uh, to the continent as well. It's time to it's time to start entering the continent and uh, seeing how I can help, right? Uh, KW Don 7 is here, right? KW Don 7 is here as well. He says, Acorn has invested in a mining company in the Congo. I wonder if he will allow children to be exploited in those mines. Early prediction, he does. Early prediction, he does. Uh, I won't get into why I say that, but you guys could probably guess. Early prediction, he does. All right. Uh, Drigo Cooper Fatari says, Gaddafi, was working to unite all African countries, or at least all the ones outside of, of, of AFRICOM. There were 13 countries a part of AFRICOM at the time I was on the continent. Gaddafi was, I mean, let's, let's be real about it. Gaddafi was an Arab and his, his intentions were really to bolster uh, the quote unquote Arab plight at the end of the day. Rico Cooper says Acorn is borrowing a lot of money from China. Uh, Kevin Carefoy too says uh, a lot of these black celebrities sold their souls to the enemy. Amen. All right. Uh, let's continue. Let's continue. But this is some interesting stuff. I, I really got to sit down and put this whole picture together. Because if you're listening to it, too, this goes back to the episode I did with the pro-black perspective. You know, Nkrumah doesn't sound too good in some of this stuff. But again, I need to sit down and fully understand the picture that's being painted. The Casablanca powers were not to be unchallenged for long in their play for control of African Union. Uh, Unism, uh, sorry, unionism. 
more moderate elements in the labor movement have been laying plans for establishing a competing organization even before the Casablanca meeting was held. In January 1962, this rival group convened in the Senegalese capital of Dakar. Those attending represented approximately 50 unions from 30 nations. They agreed to form a loose organization called the African Trade Union Confederation. The main way in which the ATUC differs from the AATUF is that the former does not forbid the affiliation of African unions with international labor organizations. Thus, the effort to cut off the African labor unions from ties with free world labor movements was, at least for the time being, foiled. Prior to Dakar, none of the unions in the AATUF had complied with the Casablanca Conference demand for disaffiliation. The labor union movement usually plays an exceptionally influential role in the political affairs of African countries. Uh, no other segment of society is organized and labor unions represent almost the only grassroots organization aside from the somewhat primitive political party structure. Okay. This is where reading is good, right? If you read long enough, you'll get the answers to the questions that you have, right? If you agree with that, type one in the chat, right? You read long enough, you'll find the answers that you want, right? Or, or the answers that you need, more importantly. Thus, the decision taken at Dakar to permit continued affiliation has an importance not only for the labor unions, but for the political development of Africa as well. The Casablanca powers suffered a serious setback at Dakar. That makes sense. Okay. So the Brazzaville powers, African uh, Malagasy Organization for Economic Cooperation. As the Ghana, Guinea, Mali Union forms a certain core of the, of the Casablanca power group, so the Brazzaville powers represent a core of the Monrovia grouping. In December 1960, 12 of the newly independent French-speaking African countries met in Brazzaville to form a loose community of states formally tied to France. The 12 were Cameroon, Central African uh, Republic, Chad, Congo Republic, also oh, Chad, Congo Republic, which is Brazzaville, Dahomey, Gabon, Ivory Coast, Malagasy Republic, Mauritania, Niger, Senegal, and Upper Volta. In subsequent meetings in Dakar and Yuande in the early months of 1961, these 12 nations established the organization African at uh, Malagash de Cooperation Economic. Guinea and Mali have been suspiciously absent from all of the Brazzaville group meetings despite serious efforts which continue to be made to bring these two strays back into the fold. Togo also remains outside of the Brazzaville group, although it is one of the Monrovia groupings. Among the specific objectives of the OAMCE, are the establishment of a joint development program, development bank, formulation of common investment codes, and the coordination of relations with the European common market. The Roosevelt powers have already combined their individual air services in a common airline known as Air Afrique. The leadership of the Roosevelt group is contested, though somewhat dispassionately, in comparison with other intra- African political jockey among various leaders of the French community. President Serrano, Ser, Serranana of Malagasy is president of the OAMCE, but probably the greatest political power rest in the hands of President uh, Houphet Boigny of the Ivory Coast. Houphet Boigny not only retains a considerable influence in political circles in France, but also occupies a strategic position as head of the largest and strongest political party in ex-French West Africa. The Razamblant 
uh domata creek D domata creek uh african or the rda he has a strong attachment to france to western values and to the free enterprise system we fit boygny's fundamental problem is one of maintaining the basic positions which he personally favors in the face of powerful african nationalists forces challenging him from the left the Brazzaville powers are motivated primarily by a sense of belonging to a French-speaking community. Mm. The cultural and spiritual fountainhead is Paris. They have benefited and continue to benefit far more than the ex-British countries from their economic association with their former mother country. Isn't that a shame to hear former mother country? The OAMCE, in confining itself to the ex-French territories, is an exclusivist grouping, although each of the member states realizes the importance of broadening contacts and trade with non-French African countries. Oof. Uh, it's heavy. Right? It's heavy. What's going on? What's happening currently? You look at the history of Africa after its encounter with these savage Europeans. It's heavy. Do you guys understand what I mean by that? By the way, I don't see anyone typing one in the chat to my to my question, man. Uh, but yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. Uh, we've come to the section uh, called the Council de Intente, right? Uh, before I get into that, let me he head over to the chat room. Uh, chat room. Uh, Dorico Cooper Photography says, Acorn inherited a diamond mine, but he sold it. Diamond game is more dangerous than the dope game. Yep, I can see that. Uh, he goes on to say, Democratic Republic of Congo has been appraised at 24 trillion worth of natural resource wealth. Gold, he, he goes on to say, gold, copper, uh, coltan, uranium, tin, diamonds. Coltan is the real life vibranium. Smartphones can't exist without it. Kevin Carefoy too comes through and says France is a welfare state that rips off their former colonies. Everything you guys just said is true. You know, I think about this almost, uh, literally almost every day. Like, if you're African, right, from the continent, and you're from the Congo, for example, right, the DRC, and you you've grown up long enough now to know just how important the resources in the congo is right uh you would think you would think that regardless to what they can give you right as a as a what's the word i'm trying to find as a reward for selling out your people selling out the earth beneath their feet at some point i would think there's something in you that would say hey man i want to see my people win yeah they could throw me a couple million dollars but i won't see my people win And it's just amazing how we have so many folks who are just not willing to see their, their group of people win. My, my, my belief is, and you guys tell me if I'm silly for this belief, my belief is if you help your people win, you will get more from your people. Right? Once your people recognize what you put in to see them win, your people would be, you know, your people would reward you, right? 
Rico uh, Cooper Fatari says, I'm all about pooling our money to own mining companies in the Congo and elsewhere on the continent to dictate how they operate and deal with our people as massive shareholders. This is one way. Yes. You know? Man, it's just... Poifet Barney's strong position in French-speaking Africa is also reinforced by his commanding position in the Council de uh, Entente, consisting of the four contiguous states of the Ivory Coast, Niger, Upper Volta, and Dahomey. Formed in May 1959, the Council comprises a customs union as well as a quote-unquote solidarity fund for financial assistance to each of the member states. I do believe I I talked about doing something like this before. Uh, monies are contributed to this fund by each of the four countries on the basis of a formula reflecting capacity to pay and withdrawn in a roughly inverse ratio according to need. The Ivory Coast is by far the largest contributor. The council has also provided for the coordination of the development plans of the four states and of their policies in the fields of taxation, public administration, labor legislation, public works, transportation, and communications. The council came into being as a result of a coup executed by Hoyfit Boigny in luring Upper Volta and Dahomey away from a short-lived association with the abortive Mali Federation. This coup helped to give him a stronger power position than the political leadership of Senegal, which had traditionally dominated French, French West African affairs. The future of the council will depend on the relationship it is to have with the OAMCE and the still larger Monrovia groupings. This brings us to a part of the paper that's about the Monrovia powers. The grouping of 20 states, which have come to be called the Monrovia powers, met in the Liberian capital in May 1961. Most of the countries attending were represented by heads of state, the Brazzaville nations of Cameroon, Chad, Congo, uh, Dahomey, the Ivory Coast, uh, Malagasy, uh, Mauritania, Niger, Senegal, and Upper Volta, as well as Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Somalia, and Togo. In addition, high-level delegations represented Tunisia, whose president could not attend because of his state visits to the United States the United Kingdom and Canada, the Central African Republic and Gabon, whose presidents were ill, Ethiopia and Libya. The Monrovia Conference was an important landmark in the labyrinthian pattern of African bloc politics. It was the largest assemblage of top leaders of independent African states yet to convene. The tone of discussions and the resolutions passed at the conference reflected a wide area of agreement on questions pertaining to Africa's political and economic future. Tafawa Balewa, Prime Minister of Nigeria, emerged as a dominating personality. His moderation, which prevailed throughout, was in large measure responsible for agreement on a gradual and functional approach toward unification in place of, a, in place of an extreme pan-Africanist approach. Indeed, the Monrovia Conference was a direct challenge to Nkrumah. The London Times, corresponding covering the meeting, observed that it, quote, marked the beginning of the end of Ghana's leadership in Africa. This section is the Lagos meeting of African heads of states. The Monrovia conf uh, conferees empowered a standing committee to make preparations for an African summit, which was held at Lagos in late January 1962. Great expectations had been aroused as the time for the Lagos meeting approached, and hope was held out until the last that this meeting might be attended by representatives of the Casablanca powers so that the gap between them and Monrovia powers might be at least narrow. Exactly the opposite occurred. The Casablanca states announced their decision not to attend just before the preliminary meetings of the Lagos uh, conference got on the way. The announcement, which came from Accra, charged that 
the decision of the Lagos conf uh, conferees not to invite representatives of the Algerian FLN threatened to undermine the Algerian independence movement. The Casablanca powers therefore could not attend. Guinea and Mali were reported to have favored participation, but were firmly reined in by Ghana. Casablanca powers had to decide whether they could thwart the moderate leadership of the Lagos meeting more effectively by boycotting or by attending and subverting from within. The fact that the rift has been kept out in the open may be in the long run interests of the moderate influence which remains dominant among the Monrovia grouping. The country's president Lagos were the same as Monrovia except that Libya and Tunisia dropped out on the issue of Algerian representation while the Congo and Tanganyika were added to the ranks. The conference which was preceded by a foreign minister's meeting was attended by seven heads of state or government out of the 20 nations represented. The meeting authorized a formation of working committees at cabinet level to coordinate regional activities in the areas of economic development, trade, education, health, agriculture, transport, and communications. It approved, in principle, a charter for an inter-African and Malagasy states, organiz uh, states organization, which, if implemented, would far transcend any previous effort to give content to the goal of African unity. The charter provided for two high-level forums, an assembly of heads of states and a council of ministers together with a, with a permanent uh, secretariat to administer the organization's communities and commissions. The final plan for all of this organizational structure was to be worked out by a meeting of foreign ministers later this year. The Lagos confer, uh, conferees displayed a strong determination to put into effect the decisions they had taken if for no other reason than because failure to do so would leave the field open to the Casablanca powers. Should the Lagos uh, resolutions be fulfilled, the meetings will have been perhaps the most important single step on the road toward African unity since independence. Hmm. Interesting. If the decisions are not implemented, Lagos will mark a turning point at which the momentum gathered hitherto by the Monrovia powers will be seen to be slackening to the detriment of the cause of unity via the gradual functional approach. Brings us to a section called East African Common Services Organization, formerly East Africa High Commission. We check in with the chat room, see if anything is going on. Uh... Uh, Dorico Cooper finished that previous thought. That previous thought was, I am all about pooling our money to own mining companies in the Congo and elsewhere on the continent to dictate how they operate and deal with our people as massive shareholders. This is one way for the diaspora to help the continent. Uh, he goes on to say, France is a welfare state. When Gaddafi invested 300 million and told about 45 other countries on the continent to come up with the rest to have satellite built by China and launched by Russia. Uh, yeah, that uh, the continent was paying $500 million a year for rent to have telecommunications in Africa. Uh, so Gaddafi and then was willing to put up 300 million and the other 45 countries were to come up with the rest of the money to have a satellite built by china and launched by russia and that's something i really want to see change all right now he, he he was doing what you know with what he had to work with but what i really want to see change i want to start seeing some African countries, and I know a lot of African countries are destabilized intentionally, of course, but it'll be, it'll be it, you know, it's time to start seeing the work being put in where some African country, uh, 
I don't know which one, but some African country have the ability, the mind, the brain power, and the mind power to launch a satellite, to launch uh, you know, just a, a rocket to send something to the moon even. It's, a, it's, it's about time for that now. Real talk, right? We, we, we see these stories, like in America, we see these stories like hidden figures of these black women who back in the day did the mathematics, right? Of how to uh, get uh, shuttles into space and all this kind of stuff, right? And I'm, you know, I'm, when you read and, or, or, and or watch the story, you see that these women had to use bathrooms like across a campus or something like that, right? They couldn't go into the bathroom right next door to where they were doing the work. They had to run their asses across campus. What I'm getting at is clearly there's the there's the brain power, right? There's the brain power to do all this advanced mathematics and stuff. You're telling me we don't we can't get the people together, get them out from these countries working for these other institutions for NASA and the like and we in the continent right we can get an effort to really send something towards towards the stars it just blows my mind it just blows my mind I know what someone's gonna say um you know someone's gonna say to themselves at least uh, you know, it takes a lot of money and this, that, and the other, but come on, man. Anyway. West Africa remains sharply divided as of the present writing between conflicting orientation. Perhaps a somewhat more hopeful prospect for unity may be found in current developments in East Africa. Sorry. <clears throat> the 1961 agreement to establish the East African Common Services Organization was one of the more promising signs on the African political front. Largely on the initiative of Prime Minister Nayere Representatives of the government of Tanganyika, Kenya, and Uganda, together with an observer from Zanzibar, met at the British Colonial Office in London, June 1961, to formulate plans for cooperation during the interval when Tanganyika was to achieve independence and the other two were still working toward it. Basically, the new organization represents a continuation of the functions formally carried out by the East Africa High Commission established in 1948. That commission, which consisted of the governors of the three territories, together with a representative of Zanzibar, provided a joint administration of communications, transport, customs, currency, and various technical services. The new East African Common Services Organization came into effect in December 1961 when Tanganyika achieved independence. Specifically, it coordinates communication finance, commerce, and social services in the three African countries. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the new institution is the fact that responsibility for its administration rests with three African elected ministers, Prime Minister of Tanganyika and the principal elected ministers of each of the other two territories. The British government has shown great discretion by allowing the initiative for the Africanization of an institution which it created to appear to come from Africans. The, let's read that again. The British government has shown great discretion by allowing the initiative for the Africanization of an institution which it created to appear to come from Africans. The institution can only be strengthened by the change. The area, for his part, has again given evidence of his moderation and statesmanship by agreeing to share equal partnership with two territories that are still working towards independence. And I think that right there is the failing of Nkrumah. 
functional cooperation through the East African Common Services Organization could pave the way for a federal political grouping in East Africa. The federal approach, it was widely hoped, would help to bring harmony not only in the relations between the member states, but also for dealing with a number of thorny issues which otherwise have little chance of being resolved, such as the opposition of the Baganda and other uh, feudalists to formation of a national state of Uganda, the Arab uh, irredentism on the Kenyan coast, and the Maasai tribal objections to being divided by the Kenya-Tanganyika border. An East African Federation, if it should come into being, would not be a panacea for all of East Africa's ills. A certain rivalry between the member states is natural and, in and inevitable. This could benefit itself in a political struggle between Kenyatta of Kenya and the Yere of Tanganyika for leadership. So in the area is offered the presidency of any federation that emerges to Kenyatta. Since his release, Kenyatta has disappointed British hopes that he might unite the country behind him in an orderly movement toward independence. An unexpected aloofness and a certain ambiguity seem to have reduced Kenyatta's once powerful appeal. Failure to achieve some national unity in Kenya would bode ill for the prospects of East African unity. Right? Nevertheless, some encouragement may be derived from the area's decision to, to stake his and Tanganyika's lot with that of their fellow East African nations, even though they lag somewhat behind in progress towards independence. The area has eschewed the extreme nationalist approach which, have, which would have favored a sovereign Tanganyika's going in alone. But by so doing, he may well have improved the prospects of his own and his country's leadership in East African affairs. The prospect of the continuation of an East African Economic Association under African control carries the highest significance for Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Both territories might become candidates for membership in such a regional grouping. Even Southern Rhodesia could become eligible in the event that white minority rule should ultimately give way to rule by a black majority. Southern Rhodesia could form a bridge linking the East African grouping to uh, Bachonaland, and conceivably to an independent Southwest, Southwest Africa. All these co uh, countries share the heritage of British colonialism. English is the national language in each of them. Finally, the island of Zanzibar, the two states with, and the two states which will emerge from Rwanda and Urundi, uh, being contiguous with Uganda and, and Tanganyika, would seem to fit logically into an East African grouping. And that, later on, that actually happened. When Oni and I talked about that paper, at the time it was just the three countries, but more recently, They've included, uh, uh, you know, these smaller countries. Here. Somalia is another possible addition. So this brings us to Pan-African Freedom Movement of East, Central, and South Africa. Formal basis for regional cooperation between nationalist movements in East and Central Africa emerged from a 1958 meeting at Mwanza, the shores of Lake Victoria. Nationalist leaders from Kenya, Uganda, Tanganyika, Nyasaland, and Zanzibar met together to form what came to be known as PAF Mecca, the East African variant of the Pan-African movement, although it had roots in an earlier period, was given concrete expression considerably later than its counterpart in West Africa. In the West African countries, being less under the domination of white settler minorities, uh, were more advanced politically. The Pan-African movement thus had its first foothold in the British and French countries of West Africa when African elites began to emerge. Inspiration for the movement had come originally from Negro intellectuals outside of uh, Africa in the British West Indies, the United States, London, and Paris. The ideas were initially uh, sifted 
into Africa primarily via West Africans with whom they were able to establish an intellectual rapport. But the West African Pan-Africanists, Nkrumah, Ezekiel, Awaloa, Ture, and Senghor, had no monopoly on the Pan-African concept, which, which readily found adherence among nationalist leaders from other parts of the continent. Since his days in London, when he shared a room with Nkrumah, Kenyatta has espoused the cause. Tom Mboya of Kenya is another leading Pan-Africanist. February of this year, the Pathmeca powers met at Addis Ababa, where they were joined by delegations from Ethiopia, Somalia, Urundi, Anayasaland, Northern Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, uh, Mozambique, Republic of South Africa, Southwest Africa, Osutoland, the Chonoland, Swaziland, although there were no representatives from the Congo or Angola, both countries were regarded as within the fear of, of conference uh, of conference interests. A major move at the opening of the meeting was the inclusion of South Africa in the official name of the organization, thus changing it from PAF Mecca to PAF Mexa, right? South Africa. Further indication of the importance attached to Southern Africa was the election of Kenneth uh, Kaunda of Northern Rhodesia as chairman of the organization for 1962. Kaunda was successful in attracting wide support for his country's drive for independence. He made clear that unless Africans won major concessions towards African rule in 1962, his party would forsake his commitment to nonviolence in 1963. You know, I asked that question on Twitter the other day. I asked a question, and I'll ask it here. Why are Africans so hell-bent on nonviolence? Someone said because they're afraid to die. Well, to that I said, we're all gonna die. None of us make it out of this alive. Right? So again, the question stands, right? Why are we so predisposed to this idea of nonviolence? I'd like to hear you guys' comments on it. In the meantime, let me finish the paper. Observers at the Addis Ababa Conference gained the impression that the area stretching from Ethiopia southward has a better chance of achieving a working unity than any other region in Africa. The political orientation of PAF Mexa covers a wide range from leftist extremism to a neutralism which is not unsympathetic to the West. As of the present, the prevailing attitude appears to be one of determination and opposition to the remnants of colonialism in South Africa combined with moderation in the general view toward Africa's present-day problems. So this brings us to Economic and Technical Assistance Organization. A multitude of agencies are engaged in channeling economic and technical assistance to the emerging nations of Africa. Some of these are instruments of European governments established to channel aid to their colonial territories or associated states. Numerous multilateral agencies, such as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, are also supporting African development programs because of their exclusively African orientation. Following organizations deserve mention in this catalog. The Economic Commission for Africa, the Commission for Technical Cooperation in Africa South of the Sahara, and the Scientific Council for Africa South of the Sahara. The latter two groups are frequently referred to jointly as the CCTA CSA. They share a small permanent secretariat with offices in several European and African capitals. Well, none of these three organizations is a block grouping. They are cited herein as mechanisms for promoting cooperation between African states. The Economic, the economic Commission for Africa, a regional economic commission of the United States was set up in 1958 with headquarters in Addis Ababa. It is the counterpart of, of uh, commissions established earlier in Europe, Latin America, 
in the Far East. Membership in ECA consists of the independent African states, as well as those European nations, which still administer colonial territories in Africa. Consultative status at ECA's periodic meetings has been granted to many other UN members. States interested in Africa, including both the United States and the Soviet Union, and to numerous UN specialized agencies, as well as private organizations. The Commission's Permanent Secretariat of Addis Ababa, with its large staff of international civil servants, uh, provide the only effective mechanism on the continent for viewing Africa's economic problems in their entirety. Hold on a second here, let me deal with something real quick. All right, the CCTA CSA was created in 1950 after prolonged discussion among the European colonial powers of the need for coordinating their policies and programs of technical assistance to Africa. CCTA as a device for coordinating the administration of technical assistance and CSA as a scientific council composed of, re of recognized experts competent to, adv to advise CCTA on a non-political basis. Both groups originally had representation from four European colonial co uh, countries, Great Britain, France, Belgium, and Portugal. African membership was confined to South Africa and the two Rhodesians. Only sub-Saharan countries considered to be in a position to provide technical and scientific assistance to other African nations. All of the newly independent African states have now joined the CCTA, CSA, and the founding colonial countries are assuming an association, uh, oh sorry, assuming an associate status. Pressure has been applied by a number of the newer members of the organization to force South Africa to withdraw its membership. The division of functions between ECA and CCTA, CSA is far from precise. In general, ECA tends to be an economic planning and programming organization, while CCTA slash CSA is chiefly an operational agency actively engaged in technical and scientific projects. This brings me to uh, This brings me to the conclusion. Uh, let me, uh, I was gonna take a station break. Let me just read the conclusion. Of the new states of Africa, none has sought to play a more aggressive role in international affairs than Ghana. Indeed, Nkrumah's very efforts to seize the leadership of the Pan-African movement have spurred the Brazzaville and Monrovia groupings to counter with a drive toward African unity which in comparison with Nkrumah's Pan-Africanism is less political and more functional, less continental and more regional, less precipitate and more gradual. The outcome of the struggle for power between various blocs and, and groupings in Africa is anything but clear. Meaningful progress towards sustained unity of any kind will be difficult at best. Even the most extreme the uh, nationalist recognizes that Congo-type chaos brings benefit to none except the communists who exploit it to their own ends. But just as many African leaders oppose Nkrumah's flirtations with the Soviets, they will also strongly oppose efforts by the Western nations to interfere in their affairs or to establish areas of special influence. And that is the end of the paper no 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 uh, many africans outside of the ex-french areas have come to regard the association of these areas with france and the common market as impediment to the cause of broader african unity yep as negotiations for british entry into the market have proceeded it has become increasingly apparent that one of the principal hurdles to be overcome at brussels is the opposition of african nationalists to the concept of a Euro 
or a year Africa, which implies special, if not imperial privilege for Europe. In the months immediately ahead, the Monrovia group and the East African nations will both be seeking to consolidate the progress they have thus far made toward unification. All African groupings will be anxious to determine their commitment to the anti-colonial cause by vigorous opposition to any effort on the part of Europeans to block further, in, uh, further independence movements in Southern Africa. This will be a crucial period in determining whether Africa is to be spread more, is to be spared more violence in its progress toward unity. And that's the end of the paper. Did we learn anything of use currently when you're talking about unification movements or, 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 or African unification movements? Right? We learned some history. Did we learn from the history? Is there anything that we learned from the history that's useful going forward in the chat room? Uh, in the chat room, there's a lot of activity. Let me see if I can catch up. Rico Cooper Photography says 400 million one time investment for Africa to own their own satellite cut off a 500 million cash cow from France. Next thing you know, Libyan airspace is shut down and declared a no fly zone. Mm. Uh, uh, Kevin Carefoy two points out something interesting. Uh, it says YouTube is messing with my likes. It went from nine to four. You know that's true. It was, it was up there like seven, eight, nine, and now it's down to three. Action. That's wild. Uh. Uh, Dorigo Cooper says, yep, and you're cutting in and out. Is that right? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're telling me something about an audio stream, bit rate, or whatever. Uh, Better Madison Podcast is about to be a Discord-only podcast. Uh, Kevin K says, Puck screw tube. Uh, Kevin Carefoy 2 says to Dorico Cooper, photography, it's called a screw tube shadow bath. But yeah, Discord it is, way better. Uh, Dorico Cooper photography says he spoke some truth on an ooish. You guys know what the ooh, who, you guys know who the ooish are? On an ooish channel. And their moderators had the capability to literally turn off my device. I couldn't turn it back on for like 10 minutes. Wow. Is that right? Wow. Uh, Kevin Kier says, devils. Uh, he said, Dorico says this was after the P. Griff and Cannon talk, right? Uh, Kevin Kier 42 says, the Uish are getting kicked by my girl called Rona, and I do not feel bad. Dorico Cooper says, I feel you. God don't like ugly, and the wicked is going to get what's coming to them. Uh, Kevin K42 says, a religion of peace, and Muzungu God shames them not to fight. So he's answering the question I asked. Rico says, basically, and it says, couple with fear. And that's the thing, man. Fear. Muzungu influence, uh, Delenda, Delendas? I don't know what that is. Uh, Dorico Cooper Photography says, quote, come on, you sons of bitches. Do you want to live forever? End of quote, needs to be the attitude. We're all going to die anyway, so let's put the fear behind us and let it push us to the goal of sovereignty. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, death is better faced together as a collective and for a righteous cause like sovereignty, but decentralized like a Pan-African Bitcoin, right? I mean, if you're gonna die, hell, right? If that's our destiny, 
right? To, to use the only time I say term, right? You just prefer to be nevolutionary and just never do anything and just die having done nothing and hope that, you know, maybe the next generation takes it up, right? I mean, that's wild. That's wild. No, oh, the 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 lender has to, means must be destroyed. Okay, all right. You know, it's wild, and so there's so much to be done, but the struggle is not dead. All right, the struggle is not dead. There is work that we can do. Right. Oh yeah, okay. Kevin Care forty two says that's what the that's what the Romans said about Carthage. Cartago the lender S, which means Carthage must be destroyed. That was their daily chant, from what I understand. The pro black perspective laughs at the idea of nevolutionary. Right, the term that he uses, evolutionary. I mean, I get it. It's easy to just sit down and eat and drink and shit and don't do any other shit besides that. You know, sleep with some folks and, you know, feel good for the moment and then wake up tomorrow and look for, you know, another set of feel good moments. I get it. But the ultimate feel good moment uh, is to see progress, is to work and to see progress. That's what's ultimate. And this thing that we're doing, sitting around, being do nothings, uh, doesn't really make sense. I'll also say what's also what also doesn't make sense is sitting around <clears throat> I want to word this properly is sitting around um and bickering about how to get something done. Look, we have a goal. Let's get to the goal. Right? When I read this type of paper, uh, that's what I hear in my head, right? I hear folks sitting around, bickering, having meetings to bicker and to disagree, or, or calling for meetings, just not to attend, and all that old stuff. It, it's just wild to me, right? It's just wild to me. Uh, but anyway. That's the paper for tonight. If you haven't joined the Discord, please do. By the way, you guys who are here, make sure you like the video because whatever happened with dropping the likes, that doesn't mean that you can't re-like the video. Like the video again. I, I want to see uh, what's going to happen if you re-like. If you, if you notice that your likes have been removed, I want you to go back and see, you know, re-like and see what's going to happen. Are they going to update the likes again? But it's wild that they would do that. By the way, KWAZ Radio, the Twitter account has basically been been prevented from posting. Um, I think they can like stuff, but they cannot post new material. So like how oh, I'm doing this show tonight, the, the KWAZ uh, Twitter account would repost this broadcast. Can't do it. And of course, Twitter is something that you can't really even get in contact with these folks to be able to figure out what the, what the issue is. So I'm at a loss um, for how the, the podcast network is gonna promote the show but you can still follow us 
on Instagram. You can still follow us on Twitter, as a matter of fact. You might not see much posting um, from... You, you might not see much posting from us. Um, but this is all a part of what they call like shadow banning, right? So I'm banned, it's, you know? I've been banned off of Instagram, I've been banned uh, I've been banned on Instagram, I've been banned on Facebook uh, You know, so the, the show must be doing something Right, and that's because of you guys who are coming in every week, listening to the show, giving it likes you know, and I'm sure Twitter is looking at the fact that I'm getting closer to what they call monetization. And that must be chapping their ass right now, too. Uh, no, um, not Twitter, YouTube. Uh, in, the, in the chat room, Dorico Cooper Photography says, Hannibal Barker, black man, was tearing Rome a new asshole, 70,000 dead with an army of 13,000 in a period of six hours before guns were ever produced. Kevin, uh, Kevin K says again, Puck screw tube, the pro-black perspective says that's crazy. My like is at, is at four. I took it off, went to three, and put back to four, right? Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's wild. Um, all of this shows you that, uh, all of this shows you the importance of having these discussions, right? All of this shows the importance of having these discussions because if they got to go that far, that means that the message that you're giving is it, 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 too good, right? And when you look at other guys, I, I'll, I'll say it, you look at the Tariq Nasheeds and whatnot, right? Those guys are monetized, right? Those guys are getting their likes, their numbers, et cetera. More power to them. But they're doing that and they're allowed to do that in a sense because they're not a threat. In fact, they do the work of our enemy, right? Uh, Rico Cooper said that ass will cause a rewriting of military doctrine. Yes, it did. So with that said, guys, this has been another episode of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I appreciate you all for joining me tonight. I think on Monday, because you see, Ty, I'm sorry, Monday. I think on Thursday, I might just come and do one of those shows where I just have a discussion with you guys. Because if you look at the titles of shows like this, it's kind of easy for a mofo, right, to target me, right? African unification movements. You see what I'm saying? Uh, uh, you know, so, you know, maybe I just come on, have a discussion, a general discussion with you guys. As a matter of fact, you guys might be giving me the next discussion, which is about Hannibal. I actually was going to talk about political prisoners, but, uh, maybe we talk about Hannibal. As KW Dawn 7 just said, Hannibal didn't go for the jugular. Uh, Hannibal didn't go for the juggler and lost the Punic Wars. Uh, uh, the pro-black perspective says, I don't see Dorico's Hannibal comment. Is it hidden? I didn't hide it. And from what I see, it's not hidden. All right. Uh, I'll copy paste it. All right. But from what I'm seeing, this is not hidden at all, all right? Yeah, yeah KW Don 7 co corrected what he said earlier. He said the panic was, but it's the Punic Wars, right? Uh, Dorico says he had no support from his countrymen. So, yeah, maybe next show, uh, maybe next show we talk about Hannibal a bit in some form and make it kind of a freestyle show. 
make it a freestyle show uh where we just you know just talk it up a little bit uh so you guys didn't see that comment right there that i just post that i just copy pasted for Dorico cooper you guys hadn't seen that before Kevin K also said he didn't see it as well. Okay, so there's certain keywords that we're learning here. Uh, I see we have 10, we have 10 viewers, four likes, uh, because clearly they're, they're taking away likes now. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, Life with Nelly says, that she can see it pro-black perspective shaking their head so yeah okay so let's have a i gotta remember this now let's have a discussion we'll talk about hannibal uh we'll talk about hannibal maybe some other uh military conquests of the continent or something uh the pro-black perspective says i don't see it life says they see it yeah yeah nelly sees it <laughs> the pro-black perspective says shit. uh yeah so you see clearly they're kind of messing with it now and so clearly you know i'm gonna have to change up how i do certain things on here now maybe i'm Maybe I'm posting so much that it, you know, it allows him to catch up. But I, I did notice that uh, the numbers are starting to go higher. And I guess with monetization in the in view, they might be, you know, doing that bullshit to me now. So uh, Kevin Kerr says now five likes. I still see just four person. But in any event, thank you guys for coming through. Uh, this has been about two hours now. I'll end it here. You guys come through on Thursday with the intentions to have a kind of free discussion, but mainly around Hannibal. Uh, okay, let's talk about Hannibal. Tell me what you know. I'll tell you what I know. Let's learn some stuff together. Let's have a discussion. Let's enjoy. I want to thank. Let me go through as I as I've been doing lately. Let me go through and thank the folks that came out tonight. Clearly, Kevin Care 42 was here. The Pro Black Perspective was here. Uh, Life with Nelly was here. Uh, Life with Nelly was here. Uh, Dorico Cooper was here. KW Don 7 was here. Uh, NYC Beauties. Uh, uh, NYC Beauty, Black Excellence was here. Uh, we also had um, a newbie in the room. Let me see if I could find the newbie in the room. Uh, NYC Sports Archives is here. And I think I got everyone with that. So thank you guys for coming through. I'll see you on Thursday. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ Radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.